Thought Leadership from PwC. To some extent, completely acknowledge that confusion out there with so many acronyms and so many entities. So I think in that regard, the fact that there is this move toward consolidation to developing something more comprehensive is a little bit inevitable. There's just so much focus on this and what's kind of established practice is evolving so quickly. And as all these additional things come out, whether they're voluntary or mandatory, it's just going to continue to feed into this idea that what's kind of normal, acceptable baseline is going to continue to advance. Continuing our ESG reporting miniseries with an overview of global reporting frameworks, this is PwC's Accounting Podcast. I'm Heather Horn, and thanks so much for joining us today. Today's podcast is dedicated to helping our listeners get a sense of the current lay of the land and what's around the corner in the world of voluntary and required ESG reporting. Before we get started, I have a very short history lesson for you. So according to my team's research, alphabet soup, which you're going to hear us talking about today, was a culinary trend throughout the 20th century. But with FDR's New Deal, the name took on a life of its own in the English language. So 1933, so almost 100 years ago, a critic of Roosevelt's numerous new government agencies was quoted in a Time magazine article saying of the multitude of abbreviations, it looks as though one of the absent-minded professors had played anagrams with the alphabet soup. And for those getting up to speed on the landscape of ESG reporting standards and frameworks, you'll understand the metaphor, GRI, IRRC, CDP, TCFD, VRF. These are just a portion of the standard setters and frameworks in the ESG space. In fact, you'll hear, and by my count, we use at least 14 abbreviations in this podcast. But don't be intimidated. That's why you're listening. And even if these acronyms are familiar, the landscape keeps changing. So I'm happy to welcome National Office Partners, Andrea Sol and Valerie Weeman to give us the bird's eye view of ESG reporting. Look for other episodes in the series to take a deeper dive into any of these frameworks you want to hear more about. We have a world of reporting to cover, so let's get started. So Andreas Val, welcome back. Andreas, I think this is your podcast week since you were also our guest in our special episode, but really glad to have you here and an important starting point for many companies. You know, we've started our ESG series a few weeks ago, but today's you know, key because we're going to talk about the big picture on the landscape And it's perfect timing because we're recording this on November 5th, and there are a lot of big announcements this week. Um, But before we get into some of that, let's maybe start with just level setting. If you're new to all this, you're hearing a lot of acronyms. So Andreas, can you help us sort of lay out who all the players are that people should be paying attention to right now? Sure, Heather. There's there's definitely a lot of acronyms. I'll start with a few, and then we'll we'll unfortunately hit a few more during the course of this podcast. Maybe, maybe the first thing just to emphasize is why there are so many, and I think it's that many of them have a different focus. While there's some overlap between these different organizations, all of them have a, something that's a little different about them, which is why there are so many. So maybe starting with TCFD, and I start with that one just because right now you you alluded to everything going on in Scotland this week with COP26, where climate is front and center. TCFD is the the standard that is really narrowly focused on climate change. It's also one that a lot of companies already apply, and it's the one that is either already mandated in some places, such as the UK, or will be in the not too distant future in a number of territories. So that's sort of what's different about that one. Then we have the the Value Reporting Foundation, which was formed through the the fairly recent merger between the SASB, uh, the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, and IIRC, which is the Integrated Reporting um, Group. And what makes them different is the SASB is very sector focused. So it doesn't have a general set of standards that cuts across everything. What it has is a collection of 77 standards, and there's some more in the works that say, here's the things you should disclose if you're in sector X, and then sector Y has a completely different list. And often 
you know, there's very little overlap between the individual sectors. And the, the reason there is, and, and, and the SASB is much broader, even though sustainability is in the name, it's much broader than climate. The reason that is um, there is there's this idea that different sectors are going to be impacted by ESG in, to different degrees and in, in, in different ways. And the SASB is probably a little bit more prevalent in, uh, in North America. TCFD is kind of everywhere. The next one we'll talk about, GRI, Global Reporting Initiative, is maybe more applicable currently in, uh, in Europe. A number of large companies over there have been applying GRI for, for some period of time. And the way I would characterize GRI is, again, it's a, it's a broad set of standards, and it has a look and feel a bit more like the, like the accounting standards, not just in terms of how it's built up, where you kind of say, hey, if you have this topical area, no matter what industry you're in, go apply the standard for that topical area. So the idea is that, well, different sectors would conclude that different topical areas apply to them. Maybe the analogy to the accounting world is there's an inventory standard. And if you're in an industry that has inventory, well, then you go apply the inventory standard. If you are in an industry that doesn't have inventory, you don't apply the inventory standard. So that's kind of how GRI is uh, is built up. And again, it's a it's a broader set of uh, standards, not just limited to climate and, and environmental matters. And then the other one you hear a lot about is the greenhouse gas protocol. And this is the people may not know that name, but they, they hear a lot about scope one, scope two and scope three carbon emissions. And greenhouse gas protocol is where that guidance resides. And You'll see a lot of companies, even if they adopt parts or most of one of the other frameworks I've talked about for carbon emissions, which is, I think, right now, probably the most common thing that most companies that have ESG reporting, that's the one metric that most companies report is scope one and then some scope two and a few report scope three. They pretty much all use the uh, greenhouse gas protocol document in order to come up with those disclosures. So Andreas, just one point of clarification for the audience. So TCFD, we talked about, but we didn't define that one. So what's that one stand for? The Task Force for Climate Financial Disclosures. So like I said, it's climate centric is the the way it works. Right. Right in the name. Right in the name. Yep. And we can link to some more, you know, on these in the, in the show notes. So Definitely, Andreas's background gives me about 100 directions I want to go in, but trying to keep this focus on the overview that we're trying to give. But I'm going to turn to you. And clearly, there's a wide range of focus areas on those standards. And, you know, Andreas started talking about this recent consolidation. And that doesn't surprise me at all, because I think what we're hearing as we're talking to companies and even investors is it's like confusing. It's, you know, which one should I adopt? There's so many different sources. Um, so how do you think about that? I know you've been talking to a lot of companies and involved in some of our thinking on this. I think to some extent, completely acknowledge that confusion out there with so many acronyms and so many entities. So I think um, in that regard, the fact that there's this move toward consolidation to developing something more comprehensive is a little bit inevitable. I don't think having that breadth of different entities was really, to use the word sustainable. <laughs> um, so if I go back even a year ago, so it was probably September of last year, um, you actually had five of those organizations, um, and I think Andreas may have mentioned all of them, that issued a joint statement where they outlined um, basically their shared vision for a comprehensive corporate reporting system. So they had already acknowledged that there was sort of a benefit and a value uh, and a need really for them to have deeper collaboration and to really focus and engage more closely with the, with each other. So Val, let me interrupt you before you go on, because I think we didn't hit all of them because I think, tell me, just make for me to confirm. Yeah. So the five were CDP, right. CDSB, then GRI, IIRC, and the SASB. And, and, the SASB. and so we know that IRC and SASB merged. Correct. And then we talked about GRI, but can you quickly tell me about CDP <laughs> and so, CDSB? Sure. So CDSB is the Climate Disclosure Standards Board. Um, that's actually an initiative of the CDP. So CDP goes by the acronym now, but 
um, used to be more commonly known as the Carbon Disclosure Project. I think that was fairly well known. Um, so they were interrelated as well. So those five definitely had kind of this, um, this understanding that they would have a sort of a joint outlook that they needed to collaborate. Then, you know, you and I spoke on a webcast in June and Andreas mentioned how the IARC and the SASB merged to form the Value Reporting Foundation. And then now what you have this week at COP26 is the announcement of the formation of the IFRS trustees, new entity, the International Sustainability Standards Board. Um, so this will be the sister organization um, to the IESB. Uh, so basically a separate entity that will be focused specifically on developing, in their words, a, a comprehensive global uh, baseline of high quality sustainability standards for the benefit of investors. And I think the interesting part here is that there was a lot of speculation about how the IESB would catch up. Um, basically, that it probably would not be effective for them to start with a clean sheet of paper. And how would they really leverage a lot of the work that was done by all these organizations in order to sort of leapfrog ahead uh, and to have something that could be adopted in a reasonable period of time? So we got the answer to that this week as well. So further consolidation among those entities that we listed. Um, by next summer, the IFRS Foundation is going to consolidate the CDSB. And as we mentioned, that's an initiative of the CDP and the Value Reporting Foundation. So those will all be consolidated under sort of one umbrella um, to give that foundation. Um, so that roughly, as far as the, the main players that most people have heard of, that will leave kind of the ISB with TCFD and GRI is really the main three players. Okay. And if I'm keeping track... You mentioned nine different. <laughs> Between you and Andreas, we've talked about nine. You're saying it's basically get down to three, although you still have GHG out there, which I think is important. And then definitely, though, a lot going on and very understandable why people are having um, an issue keeping track. But also the reason I point out the nine is there's actually at least two that we haven't mentioned yet, and we may get to them anyway. But Andreas, the first one is, I know, one you've been following carefully, and that's the developments in Europe and specifically related to CSRD. Yes. So CSRD is not a organization in of itself. It's the uh, Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive. So the way the law works in the European Union is that they have these directives that come out of the center and then the individual member countries enact them into law. And they have ones that relate to reporting by by companies, uh, kind of similar to the SEC rules in, in the U.S. And what this would be is it would be a new directive that relates specifically to sustainability reporting. What's different is that unlike some of the other reporting directives that were primarily focused on public companies or public interest entities, this would apply to what they call all large entities. And the definition of large is maybe... Not as yeah, not that large. So 250 employees, and um, there's some there's a revenue and asset test. But the expectation is that something like 50,000 entities in Europe would uh, would trip this test, and that doesn't just include entities that are you know, sort of European companies. It could be a subsidiary of a company based elsewhere. So the French subsidiary of a U.S. company. If it met that one of those tests with either the size in terms of uh, the size of the business or, or the number of employees, it would be subject to this uh, directive. And so that's the CSRD. So the CSRD currently is a kind of a broad outline of what they envision it requiring. And I think the key takeaway, and we have a podcast that gets into this in a lot more detail for those that are interested, but the key takeaway is that Unlike maybe some of the other organizations we've talked about, the objective of the directive is not just to provide more information to users of reports, so investors and, and creditors and the like, so they can make better decisions. It's actually also to get information out there that will actually drive changes in corporate behavior to address the climate crisis. So it's really a dual purpose that this directive is is written for. And then just because I know everyone by now is enjoying all the acronyms, I'll throw another one in there. There is an organization called EFRAG, which is a, a European um, organization that currently their job is they review the IFRS standards 
and determine whether they are appropriate to write into European law, because IFRS is the legal, at least for public companies, accounting standard in the EU. They've been tasked to write the details that will go behind the uh, the CSRD, and so that's a you know sort of a technocratic organization that has a lot of experience reviewing standards. Now they're going to be asked to actually write standards, and they are already part at work because maybe one of the key things about CSRD is unlike these other frameworks we've talked about, which are which are voluntary. This will be mandatory, and at least as of right now, the targeted effective date is 1123, which obviously is only a little over a year away, even though the, the standards don't yet exist, although they're, like I said, they're moving quite quickly to, uh, to draft them. All right. So before we go on, by my count, we've mentioned 12 acronyms, <laughs> including the SEC. First, we're going to get to the SEC in a moment, so I'll, I'll hold off on that one. But Andreas, maybe, or either one of you, actually, we haven't mentioned the World Economic Forum, and I know they have also at least put out support for these standards and I and some thoughts of their own. So how do they fit into this conversation? I think from a WEF standpoint, what they're looking at is um, trying to be a um, sort of a, a flag bearer, a front runner to establish support for the other frameworks. I think clearly their objective is the same. They do support the use of the voluntary frameworks and the development of some of these mandatory ones. They did put out a group of metrics. It was actually in collaboration um, with the big four accounting firms. Uh, and I think at last count, there were 50 or 60 companies who had subscribed to those metrics. Um, but at the same time, they do advocate for GRI and TCFD. So I think um, in my mind and, and solely sort of one person's objective is I would expect those to either be folded in under the ISB requirements or at least the ISB to consider those in theirs and that not to really be a, a separate um, because those were, were definitely metric based as opposed to more of the qualitative disclosures. So I could see how that could be folded into others of the existing frameworks. All right. I think that's helpful. And just from my own perspective, having spent some time on the World Economics Forum's website, for someone who's getting into this, there is a lot of education. They have a lot of press releases. For example, this summer, you know, there's the first space exploration standards were put out. And so they report on what other organizations are doing. So, you know, I, I wouldn't drop them completely from this discussion because I do think they've got some good cases and examples. So, but we don't have to talk about them further here. My other big question before we get deeper into this is in listening to this, a lot of like European global organizations here, um, you know, obviously we're going to talk about the SEC, but if we talked about 12 acronyms and only SASB and SEC, I think are US acronyms. Um, Andreas, if I'm a US company listening, why should I care about all of these developments? Yeah, so I think the the key one, if you're a U.S. company, is you know again focusing on what's mandatory. Is the CSRD is coming? It's set thresholds that will catch a lot of U.S. companies, European subsidiaries, and the way the document is written is well, you can comply on that at that subsidiary level, and there's a whole bunch of reasons people may not want to do that that you know, we cover on our other podcast. But um, if if they like not to comply at the subsidiary level, but instead say, I'm going to comply by just producing my sustainability report for the consolidated company or, or the, the parent, the U.S. parent. They can only do that if if that reporting is deemed to be equivalent to what's required by the CSRD. And, and companies may not even realize this, that implicitly they're doing that today as it relates to the financial reporting, where if you have your equity listed in on a European exchange or you issue bonds in Europe, you're using your SEC US GAAP filings because those are deemed equivalent. The, the difference here is because of that second objective I mentioned with not just providing information to investors, but you're actually also trying to drive change. It's expected that the equivalence bar will be higher for non-European parent companies to use their you know, local reporting to satisfy the European requirements. And so I think what that means is because the CSRD is probably going to leverage pretty heavily both GRI and TCFD based on what we understand right now, 
those two frameworks are ones you're going to want to get comfortable with if you're a U.S. company and you have quote unquote large operations in Europe. And again, we said a moment ago, the definition of large may not be most people's definition of large. But I also think, Heather, that from a U.S. company standpoint, you have to think about what the investors are going to get used to getting. Right. So if you look at the uh, the significant extent of the requirements um, in the uh, CDSRD is, you know, if you think about a U.S. company from an investor standpoint, the investors don't know sort of geographic boundaries. So when you have investors who are doing cross-border investing um, and they have comparable or your competitors are, you know, in another country, I think they're going to get used to seeing a certain amount of information. So when you talk about voluntary disclosures and being responsive to your stakeholders, I think there's going to be some pressure to enhance um, U.S. disclosures, even in advance of any of the U.S. requirements that we talk about. Well, I agree with that. And I think to the point both of you guys were making, these rules, the CSRD rules, the ISSB rules, the SEC rules don't exist yet. In the meantime, we know investors want this information. And so people are picking from these other frameworks, either picking one or picking parts of different ones. And so sort of being conversant in this language is important. I also will note, I actually forgot that you mentioned the IFRS Foundation. And so we're actually up to 13 acronyms we've mentioned today, <laughs> including WEF. So just in case you're keeping track at home, I don't want to forget that we mentioned that one too. So Val, let me go specifically to the SEC because we keep teasing that. Um, and we've talked about this since you know the initial request for information was put out last March um, from the SEC with their 60 odd questions. Uh, and obviously we know this big response, separate podcasts on that, but what's happening right now at the SEC? Um, so they're in process. Um, so you're right. There was a lot of responses um, to the original request um, from, uh, I guess, then acting chair, Alison Heron Lee, um, but clearly consistent with the focus area of the current chair, Gary Gensler. Um, who is definitely in favor of the SEC having a mandate for climate-related disclosures. Uh, and I think even if you look at the responses to that original request for information, um, I've heard Chair Gensler say that uh, upwards of three out of every four were supportive of having a mandate. Um, so they're working on the disclosure. They're probably a little bit delayed than maybe they expected. I don't know whether it's more complicated an effort because um, clearly there, there are strong opinions on a lot of different topics. Um, but they were hoping originally to have it issued in uh, October. So obviously that didn't happen. More recently, we've heard that the expectation is to have a proposed rule. So now um, we're actually only up to the proposal stage. This wouldn't be a final rule yet. Um, so the proposed rule should be out by the end of this year into early next. Honestly, personally, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw something before the end of this year on a proposal. All right. And then if you're looking in your crystal ball, any thoughts on what might be in this proposal? Uh, they've sort of teased out a couple of things. Um, I think it's going to be pretty broad. Uh, again, I think like we talked about for the ISB, it doesn't really make sense for them to start with a totally clean sheet of paper from scratch, given all of the work that all of these other entities have done. So um, I think that at the same time, the SEC is clearly going to want to develop a framework uh, of requirements that make sense for the U.S. regulatory environment. Chair Gensler has asked the staff to be, I think the word he used was inspired by the TCFD. So it's not, you know, embedding it, but I think the inspiration. So I think that supports having a separate framework as opposed to choosing a other, an other standard setter. The TCFD has as its four pillars, uh, governance, strategy, risk management, and metrics. Um, so I think those four elements will be embodied in the SEC rule. He's also talked about, um, as Andreas mentioned, the GHG protocols. Uh, so I think he's talked about scope one, scope two, as well as scope three um, disclosure. So those are all on the table for inclusion. Uh, they've also talked about the importance of disclosure from fund managers. Uh, I know that uh, it's sort of one of his focus areas about the criteria that fund managers use when they solicit investments uh, and call a fund a green fund and, and how that works as well as for net zero commitment. I think holding companies accountable for when they make a commitment and how they're progressing toward that, I think you could see some required disclosures in that area as well. I think the disclosures will be broadly applicable. Um, he does have the staff looking into whether certain sectors like banking or insurance or transportation should have their own metrics. 
Um, but I think the requirements are going to be pretty broad. Uh, I'm not sure yet where I think they'll fall out on principles versus requirements. My guess is there's a balance, but I know that there are really strong opinions on both sides of that discussion. So definitely a lot to think about there and and something closely to watch. One question that raises, though, is so you mentioned here the ISSB obviously is sort of, I'll say, consolidating, absorbing, whatever word you want to use, a lot of different organizations. And I think one question, Andreas, I hear from people is, how does that fit in with what the ISSB is doing? So is the SEC involved at all in that or what's their role? So the the SEC is involved in an organization called IOSCO, which is the... So 14. That's right. So we probably should have had people uh, set up a bingo board before this. Yes. <laughs> but that that's sort of the international organization where securities regulators from around the world collaborate and you know, IOSCO, the SEC is obviously a very influential player in IOSCO, and IOSCO has repeatedly said that they support the efforts of the IFRS Foundation. So I think that's probably the where you'd most see the SEC's influence right now. I mean, the ISSB, what they're trying to do, right, is set a, create a set of standards that regulators around the world could then look to for purposes of the requirements that they put in place in their individual territories is kind of their business model, I guess. And I think, Andreas, sort of key point there is for someone, again, paying attention, is they shouldn't be looking at what's happening with the ISSB and what's happening in Europe, but specifically with the ISSB as being in a vacuum compared to what's happening with the SEC. So not to say that they're going to be the same, but just that they're not completely separate. So something to keep an eye on. And then something else, I guess, as we you know kind of think about this, and I think about what you're saying, other than the 14 acronyms, is that it really seems like we're moving away from like voluntary reporting. So again, frequent listeners know I come from power and utilities industry. I mean, lots of you know, emissions and other disclosures they've been making for years. They have their own sort of frameworks for reporting a lot of that information. But that was voluntary, other than maybe their regulators wanted some of it. But now we're moving into broader requirements for required disclosures and more um, standard disclosures. So what are some of the implications of that? Well, I think certainly the major implication is, as you said, when, when you're in a voluntary world, if you look at what most companies are doing today that are maybe a little further down the journey on ESG type reporting is that they've picked this set of metrics and maybe some of that is after discussion with some of their stakeholders, but they've picked this set of metrics that they disclose and it evolves every year, but generally they apply pieces of the different standards as opposed to applying the entirety of one or multiple sets of, uh, of standards. And when you move into a mandatory world, there will be some things probably that are qualitative, but at least in certain of these areas, such as the CSRD, based on what we've seen so far, there will be some very specific required information. And again, maybe heavily borrowing from some of these other frameworks, but they will then be telling you, no, no, you have to apply the entirety of the framework, not just the pieces that you think are more relevant. And you'll move into a world that's more like the accounting world where well, if something's not material, maybe you don't have to include it as opposed to today where you'd say, well, I'm not going to include it if I don't think it's important or maybe based on my discussions with my stakeholders, we collectively don't think it's important. That's a different world than a framework saying apply it all unless something's not material, which is, I think, you know, the, the world we're going to. Now, obviously, there's some benefits of that if more companies are required to report in a in a maybe comprehensive way under similar frameworks, it's going to enhance comparability, which I think many stakeholders think it w- would be a better place to be. The The other thing that it will bring, and this again is in the CSRD, that it envisions there'll be an assurance requirement, that that requirement will step up over time, starting with something limited and then become a, a higher threshold of assurance over time as the, as the ecosystem matures. But again, that will drive a different level of compliance once you get auditors involved and once you then have regulators reviewing these disclosures because they have a a regulatory framework against which to evaluate them. So 
all of these things are coming together to probably change the the landscape quite a bit over the next couple of years. So, Andreas, one specific question on that, and then a few other follow up questions is, you know, we keep talking about climate. Again, I talk about power and utilities. Obviously, climate's been a big thing with that industry, but they also do focus on some of the other topics. And from your sort of overview of what's going on, do you think it's okay for companies to be more narrowly focused on climate? Do you think they need to think broader? Well, I I think you certainly need to think broader. I mean, climate clearly has the attention of the media and the politicians, and it is certainly out front relative to the other elements, but maybe not as well reported around the CSRD, for example, is that the other elements of the E and ESG are very prevalent there. And in particular, maybe one that I would highlight that maybe isn't on people's radar screen is that there's clearly content in there and an area of focus around biodiversity and making sure companies understand their effects on biodiversity and to the extent that those effects are not positive, what they're going to do to uh, to mitigate that. And that's maybe something that's not on a lot of people's radar screen when they hear a lot about climate change. Agree. And I also think if you, depending on your business, something like you know, if you're a global business thinking about your supplier, you know, human rights and things like that, I think there's, you know, a lot of focus on some of those types of issues as well. So keeping it narrowly focused on um, climate, I think in the long run, companies are going to need to go broader than that. But another point I think we'd be remiss if we didn't make is that we've mentioned a few times picking and choosing. And I think in practice, we do see that companies kind of take from different frameworks if they're doing voluntary reporting right now. But we did hear in a recent PwC survey we did of investors that investors like if you pick one (laughs) and or maybe pick more than one, but don't, you know, pick part of one because then it leaves questions. And maybe if those other parts are not applicable, say that or, or whatever the case may be. But Val, I know there were some other things that we heard in that survey um, including the point Andreas made about assurance, but what would you highlight for this audience as they think as they're thinking broadly about the landscape? I think that's right. I think the survey would like. I mean, investors want a lot of things, right? So, uh, yes, in an ideal world, I think they'd prefer if they could just, from their standpoint, just for you know ease of knowledge, you follow the GRI standards or you follow TCFD. And if there was one framework, I think that would be easier. Um, but I just think it's hard. I think even if that's the ideal state, I think trying to make sure that that applies to every company and allows a company to tell their full story um, may be unrealistic at this point. So definitely from a voluntary standpoint before you, although actually I'll say that even once you get to the mandatory requirements, uh, if you're not able to tell your full story using what's required, there's nothing that says you can't go above and beyond that. And I think that's what I would encourage companies to look at is where do they think they need to expand their disclosures? Where are their risks? Where are their opportunities? Um, you need to look at your own investors. Um, I, I love the chance every time I talk about this, but the word bespoke comes to mind that they really need to tailor a set of disclosures that allow them to you know, accurately portray where their risks and their opportunities are. So I think you can pick a single framework, but you still need to look at What are the additional disclosures that your investors expect, that your stakeholders expect, that you need um, or that you want to highlight that are consistent with your values? Um, So I think that's important that you don't need to really stay within that just one. Um, Although, as uh, Andreas was talking about before, if you look at something like GRI and its similarities to uh, the accounting reporting framework, that um, that may be the most pervasive requirement. So then you just pick the ones that are applicable to you. So even though you're in within the GRI framework, you still get to pick a little bit. Um, But I think the important message is really about not sticking to just the requirements and really adding additional disclosures if you need to. Right. To be clear, though, you need to meet the requirements if if you are subject to them and then go above and beyond. And I think, you know, you pick the word bespoke, I'd go the opposite direction and say, don't be boilerplate. So whether you're just doing the requirements or you are going above and beyond, or whether it's voluntary or required, if you are just putting boilerplate language in there, that's not really giving your investors what you need. Uh, We've made that point, I think, for years on the financial side. And, you know, I think this is a good opportunity when it's new for companies to really 
forge a message that applies to their particular business. So, um, but all of that said, you know, we were just talking about picking a framework. I also mentioned the 14 acronyms we've mentioned today, recognizing they're, they're coming down, but in, especially in the absence, Andreas, of specific rules from the SEC and knowing many companies are under pressure from either investors or other stakeholders to be providing more information. If someone's trying to pick a framework, narrow down their frameworks, how do you compare the different frameworks? We've given a little, but if you know you had to summarize, what would you say? So I, I think like I said earlier, they're all just a little bit different. So in I typically analogize it to the accounting world since most of our listeners will be familiar with that. So TCFD is a bit like the derivative standard. Um, so maybe a little scary, but um, for us non-FI people, but it, it's very deep and narrow on a specific topic. And so there's a lot of detail in there around how the company is exposed to climate risks and opportunities and how it sort of plans to manage those and mitigate the negative pieces of it in the future. So if that's something that's particularly relevant to the type of business you're in, the regulators in your geography or to your to your stakeholders, that has the most robustness on that specific topic, which is the hot topic today, which is why I think you see a lot of companies around the world using at least some elements of TCFD um, already today. Uh, GRI, like we were discussing earlier, is a bit more like the accounting standards overall, where it says, well, here's the broad range of things that are out there from kind of an ESG perspective. And Based on your industry and the types of activities your company engages in, it kind of helps you figure out which of those detailed standards are likely to apply to you, kind of like my inventory analogy um, earlier. And then SASB is almost coming at it from the other side. It's sort of more like from the bottom up, and it sort of assumes that if you're in this industry, we've kind of already determined based on our process at the, at the SASB that these are the things that are likely to be most relevant to users of reports for companies in your industry. And obviously that gets a little more complicated if you have a larger company that maybe operates in multiple industries, you may have to apply multiple standards, but there isn't really this uh, concept of looking to, well, what's in some other industry standard and and maybe bringing that, uh, bringing that across. So, it's almost like in again in the accounting world, if you're an oil and gas company where there's a bunch of standards that are written or an insurance company that are written exclusively sort of for your industry and pretty much everybody else doesn't pay attention to them. So it, that's probably the best analogy there. And so I think in that case, you probably have to think about, well, how specialized is my industry? Am I the equivalent of the oil and gas where, yeah, I probably do have my own things? Or am I a company that's in a, you know, maybe a less specialized industry where maybe I have more in common with other companies than I might initially think? And then I might want something that's, uh, you know, makes me more broadly comparable to, to other public companies. All right. That's very helpful. And maybe Val, going back to you, we've talked a lot here about making sure, you know, you, you do these Disclosures are very specific to you, but at the same time that you meet the requirements, and we mentioned many times SEC is going to have new rules, but I think we'd be very remiss if we didn't mention the fact there actually are existing SEC rules uh, that came out in 2010 and then even earlier, and we're seeing comment letters on those rules, so companies should start there first if they're SEC registrants. I, we're going to talk about this further in a, a separate uh, podcast, but just from a highlights point of view, what would you point out here? Sure. So, um, I mean, the rules actually go back a lot further than 2010. In 2010 is when the SEC really put out guidance that uh, tried to elaborate and consolidate what the existing rules were and how they could be applied to climate. So a lot of people are focused on that 2010 period um, because there is a document that sort of succinctly summarizes the impact for how to consider climate in terms of your risk factors, in terms of your MDNA and your description of business. So uh, you're right in that uh, the Division of Corporation Finance put out their request letter uh, 
uh, basically a sample of comments of what to expect when they're focused on compliance with those that 2010 guidance. Uh, and we've also seen a handful of letters that have already been issued to companies that are that are very consistent with the template that they issued. But the focus areas really relate to consistency of your um, sort of corporate sustainability reports and your SEC reporting. Um, so they uh, said that they will ask questions about the thought process that had you put more detail in your CSR than you did in your SEC filings. Uh, they talk about um, litigation risks related to climate as well as significant developments in federal, state, or or foreign legislation and regulation uh, that would, uh, related to climate change, that would have an impact on the company that maybe should be discussed in the filings, as well as some of the physical effects of climate change on both the company as well as their um, suppliers or, or customers. So really thinking more broadly about how could climate impact the business um, and how that can be captured within the financial statements as something that would be reasonably expected to be disclosed from an investor perspective. All right. That's helpful. And then clearly we spent a lot of time here talking about all these different frameworks, talked about potential consolidation of some of the frameworks and just the upfront work someone needs to do to decide, at least right now, that they're meeting or making sure you meet the requirements. And then do you want to make additional voluntary disclosures? There's obviously then once you make that decision, a lot that needs to happen but I'm going to ask you both a question is that more broadly, if I'm listening, trying to get my head around the alphabet suit, maybe I know some of it and looking at this year, but even looking ahead, right? Because maybe this year you'd say, okay, I'm going to do something, but I'm going to do more next year. I'm going to have a plan for how I'm going to start to communicate my company's message better. How, what advice do you guys give, especially as you're talking to companies that this is new, they're also maybe struggling with how to account with some of this in the financial statements, maybe starting with you, Andreas, you know, where would you tell a company to start and maybe not just start, but maybe what's the next step as well after that? Yeah, well, certainly where I would start is, is your company's footprint such that you are facing any mandatory requirements? So again, that European proposal, if you're going to be subject to that effective one one twenty three, which is soon, basically a year away, right? So if you if you think you're caught up in that, you want to get smart on that very quickly. Make the decision around: Am I going to comply at the level of the individual subsidiary that meets the test, recognizing you may have multiple subsidiaries in Europe that meet the test? Or am I going to try to comply at the, you know, kind of the consolidated level or maybe somewhere in between if I had a European level reporting, for example? So what's mandatory? Because once it's mandatory, you somebody else is telling you the timeline and they're telling you what you have to do. And obviously, if you're going to get processes stood up to actually meet that kind of a timeline, you have to start kind of right away. If, if you're not in the mandatory world, I think you probably need to look at how are expectations of your stakeholders going to change? There's just so much focus on this and what's kind of established practice is evolving so quickly. And as all these additional things come out, whether they're voluntary or mandatory, it's just going to continue to feed into this idea that what's kind of normal, acceptable baseline is going to continue to advance because people are going to continue to see these new standards and regulators are going to learn from regulators in other territories. And so what becomes, I don't know, acceptable baseline, middle of the pack, wherever you want to be, um, that that bar is going to move, I think, pretty substantially in the next couple of years, and it'll move even in the next year. And so starting to anticipate where that bar is going to be for your geography, your industry um, is something you should be doing, um, I think, right now. All right. And Val, how about from your perspective? I think I agree, obviously, with everything that Andrea said. But to be maybe my advice would be to focus on the proposals. Obviously, when the uh, SEC puts out their proposal, it's subject to public comment, it's subject to change, but I'm not sure that I would expect it to dramatically change. So I think it might serve as a good place to start benchmarking what you're capable of complying with, what you, where you need to build process. I think companies who have a current corporate sustainability report may have a bit of a leg up because they probably have some sort of a structure focused specifically on sustainability, data gathering process, hopefully some controls. Uh, 
Um, not that I'm advocating that everyone needs a CSR report, but I do think we need to start or that companies need to start looking at how they're going to build the infrastructure and the internal process in order to gather this data. So I think a good starting point on that would be to look at uh, the standards that EFRAG is putting out. The uh, There was a prototype of disclosures that the IASB has put out um, or the proposal that we expect before the end of the year from the SEC. And I think that's going to give you a good baseline of the types of disclosures and numbers that you're going to need to capture uh, in order to figure out uh, how you're going to accomplish that. Because, you know, Andreas keeps mentioning January 2023 for some of these uh, European requirements. And that really is a blink of an eye in terms of trying to make sure that you'll be able to comply by that um, by that standpoint if you wait until the final standard is out before you start. So I obviously agree with everything you both just said. I think maybe two things that I would add is building off actually, Val, what you just said about understanding where you are, do you have the right controls, et cetera, is that to the extent you know, you're the controller, you're in the finance organization, and you're not involved in this right now, we're seeing across the board, it's moving to finance, right? Because of the experience the teams have with controls, accuracy of data, all of those types of things. So I would highly recommend if you're not involved now, you know, insert yourself for lack of a better word, and then, you know, and, and start to educate yourself. The other point that I would make is, again, we've kind of joked about these 14 acronyms, but I know one of the things all three of us have done is actually spent time, and even if it's just an hour, looking at each of these, right? So it's an hour on SASB, an hour on CDP, you know, these these different websites. And many of these organizations have been at this for 20 years, you know, some newer, some, you know, and so there's a lot of valuable learning from that, that you can pretty quickly educate yourself on at least the basics, what you like, what you don't like. And I personally found that that is a really good place to start to get conversant quickly on this conversation. So yes, I agree to look at the proposals, but I would personally also spend a little time on what's already happened. So any final thoughts? No, I completely agree with that. Andreas? I think we need our own acronym. I agree. Maybe for the webcast, we'll come up with something. Uh, But in the meantime, as always, pleasure to have you both on. Thanks for all the insight. Thanks, as always, for tuning in. We've got a great lineup of new shows for you next week. On Tuesday, we're looking at comment letter trends related to inventory with one of my favorite guests, Pat Durbin, joining us again. And on Thursday in our Talking ESG miniseries, we're taking a deeper dive into GRI standards. Also happening next week on Wednesday, November 17th is our ESG step-by-step guide to reporting webcast. If you haven't already signed up, then head on over to viewpoint.pwc.com to reserve your spot. So that you never miss an episode of any of our audio content, follow the PwC Accounting Podcast wherever you listen to your podcast. And to stay up to date on all our latest accounting and reporting news, such as our webcast, please sign up for our newsletter at viewpoint.pwc.com. And of course, follow me on LinkedIn. From Thought Leadership at PwC, I'm Heather Horn. Thanks for tuning in. This podcast is brought to you by PwC, all rights reserved. PwC refers to the U.S. member firm or one of its subsidiaries or affiliates, and they sometimes refer to the PwC network. Each member firm is a separate legal entity. Please see www.pwc.com slash structure for further details. This podcast is for general information purposes only and should not be used as a substitute for consultation with professional advisors.